Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone on behalf of uh, Sufa Islamic Seminary for attending our program here today. We're very thankful and grateful to Sad Nama Ali Khan uh, for being here with us today. Uh, I know that he doesn't really like introductions uh, and he doesn't need an introduction with any of us, so uh, inshallah, without much further ado, I'll uh, give it to Brother Sad Nama. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ثم ما بعد جزاكم الله خيرا for attending alhamdulillah um, i was invited here to speak about islamic institutions islamic educational institutions and i actually picked this title and the coming islamic renaissance uh, and i felt this conversation is important to have from you know especially with educators and muslims in general about how we are going to be educating ourselves and the Ummah and then by extension the world about Islam. How are we going to engage in this massive, massive project? You know, Alhamdulillah, from the very inception of this Ummah, from the very beginning of this Ummah, education has been a priority. The first revelation itself is Iqra, read. And in that first passage, Allah Azza wa mentions verbs like, you know, Iqra, then He mentions Allama, teaching, He taught. He mentions al-qalam, he mentions ilm alam ya'lam. So knowledge, pen, teaching, reading are at the, at, at, in the first revelation. They're already from the very birth of this ummah, education is a priority. Unfortunately, however, today, uh, is, the education about Islam itself has actually taken a backseat. It's, it's suffered tremendously. And it's a result of, you know, a lot of, it's pretty awkward. It's a result of a lot of recent history. So what I want to do today, inshallah ta'ala, is first of all set before you, you know, the three components of Islamic education. There are three parts to Islamic education. I want to talk about that maybe in the first 25 minutes or so that I have. Then we'll have the Maghrib break. And then after the break, I'll talk to you about, uh, inshallah ta'ala, how, what approach has been taken to educate the Ummah about Islam historically, and how our efforts are actually, they're going to have to be different. They're going to have to take from what we have had in our history and you know the world has changed, things have changed around us, so we need to adapt also. So what changes do we need to bring to really effectively engage in the education of the Ummah ourselves, our families, the Ummah at large and humanity. So at the very beginning I want to divide education up from one perspective into three things. Uh, one of The first of those things is information. Information is one component of education. The next component is understanding. And the third component is application. So I'll repeat myself. What was, uh, the, the first one was information. The second one was, I forgot. I, understanding. understanding, good. And the third one is? Application. application. So information, understanding, and application. And just to make this very, very simple for, for all of us, inshallah, a child can memorize Surah Al-Ikhlas. A child can memorize even the entire Quran. And you can even argue that that child inside of him or her has a lot of information. They have that. If you ask them to recite, they'll recite it perfectly. What they don't yet possess is what? Is understanding. A child can memorize, in mathematics class, a child can memorize the times table. They can memorize 8 times 8 is 64. They can memorize the entire times table. Even if they understand it, they may not be able to truly what? understand what that means. What, how is that beneficial? What does that do for me? They're not able to understand yet. So uh, information is one thing. It's important. It is an important thing. But it's different from understanding. And understanding is important, but understanding is different from what was the third piece? Application. So th these, are, these are three separate things. Now what happens sometimes is we emphasize application. In our talks, in our emphasis, in Islam we say al-amal, right? So we have to act on what we know. Yes, application is important, but application is actually the third piece of the puzzle. Before application you have to have what? Understanding. And before understanding you have to have what? 
information. So for example, talk, talking about examples, today this, this afternoon in the khutbah, I talked to you about one example Allah gives in the Quran. About examples themselves, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَّا الْعَالِمُونَ he says, وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَّا الْعَالِمُونَ Nobody understands them except people who have information, who have knowledge. People of knowledge understand the example. So Allah mentioned the information component first, and then He mentioned the understanding component. Both of them go hand in hand. Of course, if one, for example, does not have knowledge of the Arabic language, if does not, does, one does not have knowledge of what Allah says, if one does not have knowledge of, you know, tafsir, of what the Prophet ﷺ himself explained about an ayah, etc., etc., then you can forget about understanding. That next step is not even going to happen. And the, the other uh, component here, my teacher actually used slightly different terminology, and I respect that terminology, so I'll share it with you. There is a difference between saying this person has a lot of information and this person has a lot of knowledge. There's a difference between those two things. I'll say them again. This person has a lot of what? Information, and this person has a lot of knowledge. The argument is, you can say someone has knowledge when the first two pieces are combined. What I mean by that is, information and understanding are combined, then you have what is called knowledge. Okay, so we shouldn't confuse knowledge with just information. There's a lot of information on the internet. You can get a lot of information. You can download a lot of information on your phone. You can do that. You can read a lot of books and access a lot of information. Actually, on a daily basis, we are exposed to tons and tons of information. But unfortunately, that information does not increase in our knowledge. Our knowledge doesn't advance. Because the gap between information and understanding, there is a gap between those two things. Okay? Now, of course, the third thing I told you was application or you know, practice, application. Right? Now, interestingly, in Islamic terminology, you have this issue too. You have al-ilm. Information. You have al-aql, understanding. And when you have this ilm and aql together, al-faham if you, you call it, right? You have these two things together and you act on it. Al-amal, al-ilm al-nafi'u wal-amalu bihi. They say, fadhalika huwa al-hikmah. That's actually what is called wisdom. Wisdom in Islam is when you have knowledge, not information, knowledge and Action together, application together. That's the third stage, hikmah. But hikmah a little bit later on. I want to talk about these first two stages first. Information and understanding. These two things. Now what happened in Islamic history, for a long, long time, the information of Islam has been available. It's, you know, Arabic education was widespread. Quran education was widespread. The Arabic language was actually a common second language in almost every Muslim land, even the ones that are non-Arab. So Arabic was actually a, the common language of the Muslims for a very, very long time. As a matter of fact, if you go to an interesting website like altafsir.com, which is a, the Jordanian government's effort to compile as many tafasir in one website as they can, they've built a database of tafasir together, it's about maybe 100, 150 tafasir in one place, right? When you, when you look through the names of the Mufassirun, the, actually the vast majority of them are not Arab. The vast majority of them are, are from some other region that, that you know, took in Arabic. There are Andalusian scholars, there are African scholars, you know, there, are, there are Indian scholars. You know, all of them authored their works in Arabic. So Arabic was accessible. It was accessible knowledge. But the thing about understanding was, you have to go to the alim to understand. So people, you've heard the stories, people would travel to different lands to go sit under a scholar to understand, to try to understand the Qur'an better, to try to understand the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ better, etc, etc, right? So you can, ha you can have the information, but if you really want understanding, you must go to the scholar. And you, you must sit at their feet and you must learn from them. And actually, historically, people, individuals, were institutions. We didn't have something called the university of so and so and so. We had Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. We had Imam Malik rahimahullah. We had Mushafi'i rahimahullah. We had these scholars and students would go and flock to them and learn. Our, our, there were certain individuals, they were the university. They were themselves the university. So you go to them. You don't say I'm going to the university of so and so. Like nowadays, nowadays we, you know, we say I'm going to Jami'at al-Azhar. You know, I'm going to Umm al-Qura. I'm going to Islamic University Medina. I'm going to Darul Ulum Deoband. I'm going to Nadwatul Ulama. I'm going to these institutions. 
to study. In the, in the Western sense, we say, I'm going to the University of Chicago, I'm going to you know, SMU, I'm going to this school or that school. Back in the day, what did you say? I'm going to Ibn Abbas anhu. They were the institution. And what's really interesting about that on a side note, is that in highest, the highest forms of education in the West is what? The PhD, doctorate, right? And in the doctorate program, what do you end up with? You end up with one mentor. You end up with one mentor that is going to guide you through your PhD thesis. So you end up in the highest form of education where the ummah began with its education. With a mentor that is going to guide you in your process. Now the reason for having that mentor, this is also important to understand, before we lay the framework for how we're going to do this ourselves. The reason to go to a person was not just to get information. You can get the information. You didn't just want to get the information, you also wanted to get what? The understanding, the understanding. So you went to them, not just for the information, but also for the understanding, but not even that. A suhba, a suhba saliha. In their company, you would learn how to act on that knowledge. In their company, you would, they themselves, the scholar themselves was the, themselves was the case study of how do you act on this knowledge. So when you have the scholar of hadith, every time he's about to quote a hadith, he goes and makes wudu. Right? And then he tells the hadith. Or you know, before he teaches his dars, he teaches something about the Qur'an, he prays to Allah Azza wa Jal, he makes dua, and then he starts teaching about the Qur'an. The students would see that and say, man, this guy has a lot of, this, our teacher has a lot of respect for what he does. He realizes he's dealing with something very powerful. And he, he realizes he's got a huge responsibility on him, and look at how he turns to Allah before he turns to us. You can't learn that in a textbook, you have to sit in the class and see the teacher do it every day. And then you say, wow, we're learning something from it. You know, there are different words used for that. I mean, the modern English term I used was application, right? Application. But back in the day, you would call it khuluq, you'd call it adab, you'd call it slub, you'd call it suluk, right? You'd call it suhba, you'd call it all of these things. But at the end of the day, all of it is what? You're, that's, that's how you apply the knowledge. So you don't go to the person only for information and knowledge and understanding, you also go to them to learn from their character. This was the third piece. And this is of course the, the, the piece, after this you can have wisdom. After this you can learn how to apply this stuff yourself. Right? Now we are in, when we talk about Islamic education, we cannot forget that we have to give importance to information because it's important. We have to have the right information. We have to have authentic information. We have to have clear, concise information. Then it's important that between information, you know, you, you could read something. Is it possible you read something and I read something, you understand something different, I understand something different? Is that possible? Sure. So information is not enough. You have to have a good method for developing the right understanding. Because there are people who read the same thing and they come up with different understandings. There has to be a method by which you understand. And those that have gone through this process and have trained themselves and are educated in not just understanding the right thing, but teaching you how to understand, teaching you how to think, that's an important process that has to be in place. So information is important, understanding is important. Information is a project by itself. Information is a project by itself. Understanding is a separate project by itself. And of course, what's the third critical project? Application. What's the point of all this information and nothing changes practically? What's the point if my child memorizes Qur'an and studies Arabic and knows five tafaseer and he can read this and that and he, he can you know, do the i'rab of the ayah but my child doesn't pray on time and doesn't care. What's the point? There's, there's no goal achieved. So what if he can recite beautifully? You know? So what's happened is because these are three distinct concerns it, and they each deserve time and attention and a strategy. Each one of them requires a strategy. We have to really seriously think about how we are going to address each of them and put them together for us to say we have a strategy for Islamic education. What has happened so far, so far, there was originally an emphasis on information. I'll speak for example because I have personal experience. I'll sp speak for example of Muslims that live in you know, India, Pakistan, South Asia, that, that region. There's a particular philosophy about Islam. There's a particular approach to teaching our children Islam. What is that? They should learn the Nurani Qaeda, they should learn to recite the Qur'an. After they learn to recite the Qur'an, they should memorize a couple of short surahs at least. After they memorize a couple of short surahs, they should at least have some Qari come to the house, and they go through the entire Qur'an and recite the entire Qur'an. They say, you know, Khatm al-Qur'an. You know, they just go through, let's go through the entire Qur'an, finish that. 
in, in official schooling, in, in, in Muslim countries even, in the official Islamic curriculum, you have at least studied the seerah a little bit. A little bit about the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Maybe one or two surahs, the tafsir of them, and that's it. Right, for example, in, in Pakistan, you have until metric 10th grade, right? You have like a couple of surahs, Alam nashrah laka sadrak, wadduha, you know, walayli da saja, you have tafsir of those surahs, you know, tashrih, they call them. Tashri have those surahs and you read those and that's it, that's your education in Islam. What that means is that Islamic education has been reduced just to information. All of what I described so far, reciting the Quran, memorizing a few surahs, reading a little bit of something, you know, a, a couple of things from books, all of that is what? Information. Understanding does not happen from books. Understanding does not come from books. You cannot just read books and claim that you genuinely have understanding. Understanding comes from discussion. Understanding comes from questions and answers. Understanding comes when the teacher asks you a question to make sure did you understand, and you're not able to answer, and he discusses it with you, and then you say, ah, I get it. So, so long as we are relying on books alone, so long as that's the case, and that's the primary curriculum, just learn to read this book, finish this text, finish this text, finish this text, our emphasis is still on what? Information. It's still on information. Now, even, even in the, outside the, you know, the Indo-Pak subcontinent, you have emphasis on information. You have, Muslim, you have students, for example, that travel abroad and they study Arabic. Or there are Islamic schools and, you know, Al-Madaris al Thaniwiyah, even in the Arab world, many of them, they have an emphasis on education. And let's just say Arabic education, for example, right? So some student might memorize al ajrumiyah Ibn al Ajrum, right? So he might memorize a grammatical text. Now the guy knows the Ajrumiya by heart. But if you sit him down and say, well, what does that mean? What, is that, what does this first line mean? And how does it apply to this ayah? He's not able to do that because he only learned what? Information. He didn't quite develop understanding. I, I know how to say that. I know that it says, you know, fi'il madi mabni ala al fath wa alamatu, you know. وَعَلَامَةُ رَفْعِ الْفِعِلِ This, 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 this. They could say that. What does that mean? What, what's the point of that? I don't know. We just memorized it. We just said it like that. There is an emphasis on information. Now in Western education, in Western education, there's actually a great deal of emphasis on understanding. But unfortunately, in Western education, there is a lack of emphasis on information. What do I mean? They don't make you memorize anything. They don't make you memorize, they just want you to what? Understand. So all the exams are what? Multiple choice questions. True, false, multiple choice, right? Mixing and you know, matching answers, right? That's, that's what they are. Read the following passage and answer these questions. Those are the kinds of questions you get in the Western world in any field of education. It's all about understanding. Now you go to India, Pakistan, Egypt, Jordan, Algeria, you know, Sudan. What are the students doing all day? Doesn't matter what subject. What are they doing all day? They're memorizing. Because the, the teacher says, I, you cannot have education until this information is in your head. And even if he doesn't understand, it doesn't matter. It's crazy. I, I, went, I did eighth grade in Pakistan. Eighth grade, I was in Pakistan. And in physics class, yes, they have physics in eighth grade. It's, it's torture. But they have that. In eighth grade physics, our teacher had a class on calculating the mass of the earth. Okay, the mass of the earth. And he wrote down the formula to, make, to, to calculate the mass of the earth on the board. So just a, a physics formula, took up the whole chalkboard, and we copied it down. And he says on, on, on Thursday, there's an exam on calculating the mass of the earth. <laughs> what do you have to do to pass that exam? You have to memorize that. That formula. And you have to come in line by line by line, word by word. If you ask any student, do you understand what you just wrote there? Is he going to understand? No. Nope. He's not going to understand. But he memorized it. He knows it by heart. And he knows his life depends on it too. Because it's not like the Western world. It's not like in the Western world. If a teacher hits you in the Western world, the teacher goes to jail. Teacher hits you in Pakistan, then the parents get mad and hit you more. <laughs> you know? so, so you will calculate the mass of the earth on a blank sheet of paper <laughs> on Thursday. 
In biology class, they'll just give you a blank sheet of paper and say, draw the human heart and label it. So you have to, <laughs> even if you're bad at drawing, you better draw it. And you better label everything from memory. They're not going to make you do that here in high school. Mm -mm. They're not going to make you memorize. They'll give you multiple choice questions. You know, they'll give you the scantron, just pencil, 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 pencil. And you come out complaining, man, that was long. No, that wasn't long. What they make you do back home is long. Here, there's an emphasis on what? In understanding. The, over there, there's an inf inf emphasis on what? Information. The problem is, both of these approaches have a weakness. The problem of the information approach is, you could memorize something and until now, you still don't know why you did it. You, you know, a heartbreaking story to me, I met a Muslim kid at, in last Ramadan at an iftar, at a college. We're just talking and he said, yeah, subhanAllah, man, I feel, I feel bad. I memorized Quran, but I forgot so much. So you memorized Quran? How long has it been? He has about eight years I've memorized Quran. How much do you review? Because I don't review. I stopped reciting. Why'd you stop reciting? Well, you know, I mean, I felt like my parents made me memorize the Quran so they could show me off during Ramadan. And I didn't really see the point. I mean, I, I, I could recite it, but what am I reciting? I don't even know. What's the point? All this information, but no what? Understanding. No understanding. And it leads to a problem. It leads to a serious problem. You start asking yourself, why am I even doing this? Why am I making these du'as? What's the point of praying if I don't understand? People ask that question. What's the point of praying if I don't understand? What's this information good for me for? You know? On the other hand, the other problem is, you understand it really well. You took the test, multiple choice. You know? Uh, uh, for example, you took the math test, or you took the physics test, or you took the psychology test, whatever it is, and you got 100 on the test, because you understood all the problems. But if I gave you the six, same test six months later, what would happen? You wouldn't remember anything. Why? Because the understanding was there, but what wasn't there? The information is not in your head. You don't own the information. You don't own it. So both approaches have a strength, but both approaches have a weakness. They have a weakness also. Right? Now the Islamic tradition, and, and since I have five minutes left before, before Maghrib prayer, let me just wrap this up with the following. In the Islamic tradition, an interesting thing was, used to be the case. This was the traditional approach. They would argue that children when they're younger are better able to take in information. Their understanding has not developed, but their ability to absorb information is very powerful. Now when people get older, their ability to understand gets more powerful, but their ability to absorb information gets weaker. Now you at this age, some of you sitting here, gray-haired, cannot memorize the Qur'an, now you have a hard time. You can't just listen to something and memorize it, you can't. But the younger kids sitting here can memorize in no time. They'll hear something and they'll remember it. They can regurgitate it. Mind is fresh. From the, from the mechanical side, the information side, Right? So the approach in Islamic tradition was when children are young, whatever you can get them to memorize, get them to memorize. Let's just have them memorize as much as they can when they are young. And then since the information will all already be sitting there, then as they start getting older, what do we start developing? Understanding. We should start developing understanding as they start getting older. It's a pretty intelligent approach. It's a very, very intelligent approach. Because when people get older, they have a hard time memorizing. They have a hard time retaining information, even though their understanding becomes a lot more sophisticated. That was the original classical approach. Unfortunately, we left that building halfway. So what we started doing in the Muslim world too is for children, Islamic education is information, memorize, 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 forget about the understanding. So it never happened. The, un the understanding phase never came. It never came. So the kids memorized the entire Qur'an, but the Arabic training never came. The tafsir training never came. So you have hundreds of thousands of memorizers of the Qur'an, which is information, but they never graduated into some kind of program that would allow, to, allow them to actually engage with that Qur'an that they've memorized. Besides just the tajweed of it, besides just the, the melody of it, besides that, right? We didn't develop a system for that. Now, individual hufad is a different story. Individuals may have gone on to do their, find their own path. But just like we built the Hiv school institution, we did not, as an ummah, develop other institutions that would build on top of that. Right? That, that, would, that would take information and turn it into knowledge. This is the first major problem that I'll talk to you guys about, inshallah ta'ala, after salat. How are we going to now rethink about information? How are we going to think about the, the, the bridge between information and 
knowledge. And finally, what's the final bridge between knowledge and application? How are we going to build these bridges and come up with a strategy that will truly allow ourselves to become a, you know, a thoroughly educated ummah? Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm just waiting for my water bottle. I'm just... Okay, I'll stop waiting. It's okay. Is this working? So? Uh, yeah. Okay. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Anbiya wa mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thumma ma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I've got a lot to share with you guys. I have very little time to share it uh, in. Um, I want to start with a little bit of a review in the first 30 minutes that I was talking. Uh, I mentioned that there are three components of education, and this is not just Islam, any education. Uh, what were those three components? Knowledge. No, not knowledge. Before, knowledge is made up of two things. So there's information, number one, then there's understanding, and then there is application, right? Information, understanding, and application. And each of these three are important. And there's a problem when you emphasize only one of them or only two of them or, you know, and, or, or don't have a strategy to go from one to the next to the next. If you don't respect these three things as distinct concerns that are all connected to each other, you're going to end up with a flawed educational philosophy. If something's going to be missing in the education. And this could be mathematics education, this could be history education, this could be Arabic education, and it's true also of Islamic education. Just to give you an example for, from, the, from the Arabic education, for instance, right? I can have my students memorize a bunch of words. I can have them memorize a bunch of words. And once they memorize those words or a bunch of sentences, that just means they have what? Information. They have information. If I don't teach them what those words mean, and how to use them properly, they still lack understanding. And even if I give them a lecture on the words, they have the information, and I taught them how to use them, understanding. If I didn't actually test them, and say, okay, now say, give me a sentence. Give me a sentence, say something with those words. Until it comes out of them, until they apply it, then they're not gonna know it, because they'll forget it in no time. Until the student reproduces what the teacher gave, until application happens, Understanding is not tested. So understanding is really tested when it's put into practice. Understanding is really truly tested when it's put into practice. Another interesting example of that is how Arabic is taught in the Indo-Pak subcontinent. In the Indo-Pak subcontinent, a lot of Arabic curricula focus on grammar. And I'm a student of that too. Right? They focus on grammar. And they teach you a lot of grammar and they teach you to understand text. But they never apply the text to speech. So the practice is never done in speech. So you'll have a alim, possibly even, who can read a hadith, no problem. Read it, open up a tafsir book, he'll read it like it's, you know, eyes closed. No problem. Ask him to carry a conversation in Arabic, he can't do it. La yastatiya. لِيَنَّهُ لَمْ يُمَارِسْ He never practiced that. They don't teach that. They just teach the reading of the text. So he mastered reading of the text. فَرُبَّمَا يَقْرَأِ النَّسْ أَحْسَنْ مِنْ عَرَبِيًّا رُبَّمَا he, Maybe he reads the text better than an Arab can read it. That's possible too. But he can't speak it. Because their practice was applied to reading, not to Speaking, not to communicating, so as one skill is there, the other is not there. So you have to have information, you have to have understanding, and you have to have practice. That was the premise of the first 25 minutes or so of this talk. But because our conversation is actually directed towards Islamic education in particular, I'd like to now talk about the information itself. Because this is three-piece conversation, I'm talking about the first piece, which is information itself. The information about Islam, the information about Islam can be broken down into categories. And traditionally, what do we do? We break it down into, okay, there's, there's Quran, Tafsir, Ulum, Tajweed, etc., etc. There's Hadith, there's Fiqh, there's Aqidah, there's, you know, Tariq, there's, there's Seerah, there's all this. So there's like 20 topics, right? And so the information about Islam can be broken down into Islamic subjects. That is not the approach I will take today. The approach I will take today is actually based on a much more important question that if you don't answer it, there's no point talking about education. Who are you trying to educate? Who are you trying to educate? And why are you trying to educate them? We have to answer those questions first and carefully, thoroughly, before we proceed with this, the curriculum itself. Who is this curriculum for? My philosophy is, personally, and you have complete rights to disagree with this, my philosophy is that we have to build a strategy for educating the ummah from scratch. We have to assume that the Ummah knows nothing about Islam, 
Like the average Muslim knows zero about Islam, the child knows nothing about Islam, the parent has no idea how to teach Islam to his or her child. They have no idea and we have to help them as educators, not one educator, educators have to come together and develop a plan to help every Muslim on the planet develop something that they can give to their child. So we're thinking not about the student in an Islamic school, we're not thinking about the student that's studying in a seminary or an institute. They're not a student of Bayna Institute or Sufa Academy or IQA or you know, BHA or any Islamic school. Or no, 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 no. We're thinking about the average Muslim. Everybody. Because when we say education, we should democratize it. We should democratize education. We should think about everybody. We should think about the, Mus the, the, the Muslim parents that don't even know the address of this masjid and they live in Richardson. We should think about them too. How are they going to educate their child? Maybe they want to. Just because they're not here doesn't mean they don't care. That just means they don't like this place. That just means they don't know about this place. Something's the reason, something's up. But we have to care because they're Muslims too. And the fact of the matter is the vast majority of Muslims today are disconnected from Islam, the vast majority of them, in a practical way. And they're not part of learning circles. They're not part of halaqat or Islamic institutions, learning institutions. Most, of, most Muslim children are not going to Islamic schools. They're not. But that doesn't mean they're not our ummah. They're still our ummah. They're still our people. And if that's the vast majority of them, then when we build a strategy, we have to think about them first. Before we think about the few that are in these institutions, we have to think about the many that are not in these institutions, and that is where we have to begin. And this is actually a beginning that is very possible for us today because of the advent of you know, multimedia, the internet, you know, mobile devices, all of these things that you know, sometimes you know, ulama and khatibs might complain about are actually great revolutions in education. Education has been democratized, now we have access to education in a way that we never had before. We have access to information like we never had before. So we need to think about the average Muslim. And therefore, the average Muslim, if you say, are you studying tafsir, are you studying aqidah, are you studying sirah, are you studying you know, tajweed, they don't even know what that means. When you take these subject name, names to them, they don't even know what that means. They'll just say, I, I don't know what that is, I just want to know something about Islam, man. I just want to teach my kids something about Islam. What are you talking about? And you say, you should teach your child tajweed. And the parent will say, what's tajweed? What is that? You know? How do you teach that? I don't even know myself. So we really have to go, just back to the shukran lakum, back to the drawing board. We have to build this thing from the ground up. Why? Because if we're going to talk about higher Islamic education, we want America to have, eventually we want America to have Islamic universities. We want to have mashayikh graduating from madaris, from madrasas that are in America, with world-class educations in Islam. We want our institutions of Islamic studies to be so powerful that students from all over the world say, maybe we should send our kid to Texas. Like somebody in Turkey says, I want a higher education in Islam, and they're thinking about Dallas. That's how I want it. That's what we envision. We can't get there until we build from the ground up. You can't build the top floor until you got a basement first. You know, you got a first floor first, you got a foundation first. So we got to start at the ground up. So I'm going to offer you a different categorization than the categorization you're used to. The categorization you're used to is tafsir, fiqh, haqidat, you know, etc, etc. The, uh, the categories I'll offer you are as follows. There is spiritual information. There's spiritual information in Islam. There's practical information. Second category. And there is historical and philosophical information. Historical and philosophical information. Three things. By spiritual, uh, actually no, let me t quiz you now. What are the three kinds of information I just mentioned? Spiritual. There's spiritual, practical. there's practical, philosophical. there's philosophical information. There, there, philosophical and historical, I put them together. Right, there's three basic kinds of information in Islam. I'm not talking about not, uh, understanding, I'm not talking about application. The first layer was information, just information. When I say spiritual information, I mean what is the dua to enter the house? What is the dua to leave the house? What do you say when you raise your hand in Salat? What do you, what is, you know, Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, the Fatiha, the short Surah. What do you say when you're in Rukur? What do you say when you get up from Rukur? What do you say when you are about to eat? What do you say when you're about to change your clothes? What do you say when you come out of the bathroom? What do you say when you go into the bathroom? What do you say when you change, you know, to, to get dressed or you go on a road trip, etc, 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 etc. Spiritual information in Islam boils down basically, basically to du'as. As-salat bi-nafsiha du'a. 
Salah itself is a dua. And the most important spiritual information a Muslim will have is what? Dua. How do you send you know, salutations upon the Prophet ﷺ? How do you say durood? What adhkar do you make at night? What do you recite before you go to sleep? This is all spiritual information. Okay? Now I'm arguing that that is the easiest aspect of Islamic education. It is also the most beneficial, immediately, immediately beneficial aspect of Islamic education. And it is something we should have at the earliest stages of Islam. Meaning a first grader, a first grader, even if the first grader does not understand any of these du'as, should know at least 20 du'as. The du'a to come into the house, du'a to come out of the house, the du'a to change their clothes, du'a going into the bathroom, du'a coming out of the bathroom, du'a to sit and eat at the table, du'a when you finish the food, du'a to get in the car, they should know these du'as. It's not, I didn't say a hundred du'as, I said how many? I said 20. Because I'm teaching my own daughter 20 du'as, I said that for a reason. Because my children are my experimental subjects. Right, so I, I, I conduct experiments on my kids. So, spiritual information. This is at an early age. And if they get used to this, even though they don't understand it yet, but as they get older and they start understanding it, their life will be full of so much barakah. Because the spiritual information will eventually lead to a spiritual lifestyle. When you keep remembering Allah in practically everything you do, and every one year you memorize 20 new du'as, Every year, just 20 du'as for a year is nothing. It's nothing. And the Rasul ﷺ gave us du'as for every situation in life. Every situation in life. So what happens after 4 or 5 years? And a child is a little bit older and they start understanding these du'as. Then what happens is they are constantly in the remembrance of Allah. They, they're constantly in the remembrance of Allah. Right? This, the Rasul says on judgment day, there's going to be different kinds of people under the shade of, uh, of Allah. Shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillah A young people grew up in the worship of Allah is one of them. How do you get there? How do you get a child, how do you get a young kid, a young boy, 13, 14 years old, to constantly be involved in the worship of Allah? Well, you give him du'as that have to do with real life. Not just the du'a when he's at the masjid, but du'a when he's playing basketball. Du'a when he's going, hanging out with friends. How is he going to remember Allah then? So, spiritual information. What was the second kind of information? Practical information. How do you make wudu? What are you supposed to eat? What are you not supposed to eat? What is the dress code? Not advanced fiqh, just the major halal and haram. How do you interact with non-Muslims? How do you talk to your teachers? How do you talk to your elders? Practical stuff. How do you clean yourself when you go to the bathroom? How do you put your clothes on? You know? How do you talk with your siblings? Manners are part of this, right? Cleanliness is part of this. Social, act, social dealings are part of this. This is the practical information. This is practical information, okay? And of course, as we get more advanced in Islam, older, you know, the more advanced practical information we teach. Spiritual information at early stages is just basic du'as. As you get older, there's higher levels of spiritual information. Everything advances. It grows. What was the third aspect of information? Historical and philosophical. Who is Allah? It's philosophical information. Who is Allah? What do we believe? What are His names? How do we remember Him? What does He do for us? Where did all human beings come from? Who is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Who is Adam Sallam? That's history and it builds a world view of Islam. The dua does not build a world view. The dua just helps you remember Allah on a daily basis. But knowing about the Prophets, knowing about their missions, Alayhim Salatu Wasallam, knowing about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, knowing about Allah as He wants you to know about Him, knowing about the nations that were destroyed, what does it do? It gives you a view of how Allah wants you to think about life. How does He want you to think about your role in the world? It starts building that. That's a little bit later. You don't want to give that to a one-year-old. Because they're not ready for that, really. You can give them some things about Rasulullah When you say Muhammad say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, things like that. You know? Kids at, that, at early ages, they can, they can appreciate some things, but they have very creative minds. I remember when I was a kid, and my mom used to talk to me about Allah. You know, when I was like four years old, I still remember. My mom used to talk to me about Allah, and I used to use my imagination. What does Allah look like? Because she's always talking about Allah. And, and she's always also knitting. She was always like knitting a sweater. That was her thing. So in my imagination, Allah looked like, like a, a sweater being knit. That was my child imagination of Allah. Ma'ad Allah, of course. But it's a child. It's a child. You know, the other day, uh, you know, one of the kids, he saw a shaykh. He goes, I, I saw Rasulullah. <laughs> 
they don't know what to do, with, they're too little. They don't know what to do with that information yet. You can give them a little bit and they'll have some crazy weird imaginations and that happens. But as they grow, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll move beyond it. Anyhow, so you've got spiritual information, practical information and philosophical information. Now, this is all information. This has always been there, this is not new information. But when we're talking about education, when we're talking about syllabus and curriculum, then you know what that is? A curriculum is nothing but taking a ton of information and breaking it down into digestible parts, breaking it down, and having a plan that in the first week I will give you this information, in the second week I will give you this information, in the third week I will give you this information, and laying out a whole plan. This is my year one plan. This is my year two plan. This is my year three plan. In year one, this is the spiritual information I will get across. In the year one, this is the practical information I'll teach. How often will I teach it? For how long will I teach it? Will I teach it 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day? What time will I teach it? And this is not just, I'm not talking about a curriculum for schools. I'm talking about curriculum for Muslim parents. Every Muslim parent should have a curriculum. I'm interested in developing that curriculum with the help of teachers. To develop a curriculum not for schools, but for parents across the globe. Okay, so you want to teach your child Islam? Okay, here's your seven-year-old curriculum, eight-year-old curriculum, nine-year-old curriculum, ten-year-old curriculum. You don't have to follow it by the letter, but if you want to, I've broken it down for you. Here's what you can do in the first week, second week, third week, fourth week. I want to develop that for my own kids. Why not develop it for everybody else's children too? That's, that, that's an important aspect of information, because what happens right now is you say, yeah, you're right, Ustad said we should learn some du'as. What are you going to do? Google du'as. When you Google, you're going to get 10,000, 100,000 links. Every website's going to have its own information, and you're going to be like, this is too much information. There's too much information. How do we break this down into practical bits? You know? So, uh, information is great, but until it's broken down strategically, it doesn't benefit. It doesn't benefit. So that, that's, the, that's the first dimension, information. Then what really interests me personally, understanding. SubhanAllah, we're living in a time now where information is no longer a problem. Information used to be a problem, you know that? People used to travel six, seven months to hear one scholar say one hadith. That used to be, the, information was the problem. Now the problem is no longer information. On your iPad, you can carry an entire library. And the authors of that library are from different centuries and different parts of the world. No student of knowledge 200, 300 years ago would imagine having those books in their house. They wouldn't even imagine having those books in their city. They wouldn't even imagine having those books in their country. Now you have them in your iPad. Information is not a problem anymore. You, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, if you want to study tafsir of Qur'an, and you want to compare five mufassirun, you open the stack of mufassirun, you open, you find the page, and oh, okay, okay, okay. Then you open up the next stack, and oh, it was work. It was work, right? Now what do you do? You just drop down menu, surah, ayah, pick the mufassir, bam. Tafsir in front of you. Eight centuries? No, I want to go three centuries later. Okay, bam, right over there. Okay, got it. Oh wow, I'm not impressed with this tafsir. Let me go to another one. <laughs> That's information is not a problem. You know what is the problem though? Understanding. Understanding, in my personal view, is made up of two parts. I know I give you lots of things with lots of parts, but it's just what I do. Understanding is made up of how many? Two parts. There's the lecture, there's the lecture, and there's the uh, the practice, exercises, lecture and exercises. Any classroom you've ever been in, if you've been in a accounting class, if you've been in uh, you know a psychology class, if you've been in sociology class, most of the class is what? Most of the class is what? Lecture. Most of the homework is what? Practice. Isn't that what it is? At the end of the day, all education boils down to lecture and. Practice, lecture, practice, lecture, practice, over and over and over again. Now what's the boring part? I know all of it is boring, I understand. But like, what's more boring? Lecture is more boring. Lecture, guys talking for an hour, 25 minutes. Is jihad fi sabirullah to stay awake? Right? But sometimes you find a phenomenal lecturer. Sometimes you find a lecturer that you cannot stop listening to. And he's just mastered the subject. 
And when you're listening to them, you can just, they understand, you've heard other lecturers before on the same subject, but when that guy explained the math problem, it's like, oh my God, I get it. This guy's awesome. You understand? Now, does every classroom that teaches the same math class, same math class, does every classroom have the top quality lecturer? No. You might want find one top quality lecturer over there, one over there, one over there, but most classrooms will have a boring lecture. They will. And if the lecture is not very good, does it affect the practice? It does? Yeah. One of the great aspects of the revolution of modern technology is we have, we, we have the Khan Academy model in front of us. What is the Khan Academy model? I'm impressed. I'm seriously impressed. Not just because he's Muslim and not just because his name is Khan. Okay? But <laughs> I'm seriously impressed. Why? Because his philosophy is, okay, let's take an hour lecture and first let's break it up into just 10 minute parts. Let me give you a lecture for just 10 minutes. And in these 10 minutes, I'll explain this problem to you on YouTube. And then when you go to class, all you do is practice. All you do is practice. Now let me tell you, this is actually really key here. The lecture is what you do in the classroom. Right? The lecture is what you do in the classroom. And the practice is what you do at home. Khan Academy model says, no. Go do lecture at home. We'll do practice in the classroom. And I think it's genius. It's super genius. Why? Because when you're doing homework and you're making a mistake, is somebody correcting you right away? No, because you're, you're on your own. And you're doing homework with your friend who's as blind as you are. So you're both making the same mistake. You're both making the same mistake. And even if your homework gets corrected, right? Sometimes you submit your homework, it comes back with the corrections. Does it necessarily mean you understand your mistakes? No. Is it a guarantee that every student who gets their homework corrected goes over their mistakes? You, you stick the homework in your bag, you never look at it again. You understand? Now, what if you saw the lecture on your own time, you came into the class and you started doing what used to be homework, now became classwork. Every time you get stuck, what do you do? Every time you get stuck, who's there? Teacher. Teacher's there. You ask him right away. He says, okay, remember we talked about that? That's how you do this, 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 and you go, oh. And you get it, and you do it. Now is this gonna stick or no? It's gonna stick a lot better, isn't it? It's gonna stick a lot better. The other genius of this plan is that you can have the world's best lecturers shared by everybody. Because at the end of the day, understanding, I told you, is based on two things. What are the two parts? Lecture and practice. The lecture can be standardized. The lecture can be standardized. Let's get the world's best lecturer, the best, best Alif Bata teacher on the planet. Let's get him on YouTube. Let's get him on YouTube. And let's give him for homework, the lecture. And when you come to class, let's practice. Let's practice. The other thing that this does, because there are metrics now online, is you're watching the video online and you can tell how long a student was logged on to the video. You can tell how long their mouse was active. You can tell how much time they tapped the screen on the iPad. You can have these metrics. So you can actually even tell how much a student was paying attention. Could you do that in the classroom before? No. I had a student in the first row of class, brilliant, smart kid, last year. And she read all of the Harry Potter books in class. In class. I never knew. No idea. I found out after she graduated. Lucky her, because she wouldn't have graduated if I found out. <laughs> Sihar <laughs> haram. Don't get any ideas, Father. Okay. Okay. I say we can bring this philosophy to Islamic studies. Find the best Sira teacher. Find the best of Sira teacher. Find the best, 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 you know, fiqh teacher. 10 minute lessons. 40 minute practice in class. 10 minute lessons. Lecture. 20 minute lecture. For homework. All the, the entire time in class is spent doing practical work, 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 with a guide in front of you, correcting you. You know what that does? You don't have to have the best lecturer in the classroom. You just have to have someone who knows the material. So the burden, what, what we have the opportunity to do now, is we don't have to have the kind of resources we used to need before, to have top-notch education. If we have the right strategy, we can actually 
really developed solid understanding of Islamic subjects, the first priority was information. What are you going to teach per year? In understanding the question is, how are you going to teach it? How are you going to give this information? How are you going to give this information that the student will understand? And my, my component is two things. I'll add a third. There is lecture. What was the second thing? Practice, which should happen in class. And the third is discussion. Discussion. And discussion has to happen in class. Discussion, let's, what you heard, what did you not understand? What do you need repetition on? Let's talk about it a little bit. What this does is it turns the classroom into a living place. Otherwise, the classroom is a, a one-way street. The teacher's talking, students are half asleep. Right? So this revolution in education is happening. And we have to take advantage of this revolution and bring it to Islamic studies. Because of, uh, up until now, Islamic education has been a sheikh sitting behind a mic, talking for hours. And students sitting there. And whether they understand or not, interact or not, because there's 10,000 of them. Right? So the lecture is awesome, the shaykh is awesome, but the students may not be awesome. How do you get students to be awesome? That is the issue here, right? And I, I feel personally that we have a real opportunity to completely revolutionize how Arabic is taught, how Islam is, different parts of Islam are taught, completely revolutionize this stuff. So the quality of children we get by the time they're out of high school is just a completely different thing than when you and I came out of high school. The quality of depth in understanding and information and understood information is just a different level. But this requires that we put our best minds together, strategize and put this thing together and standardize it. And I don't even say we should standardize it for one school, one family, we should standardize this for the ummah. When you standardize this for all parents, then you know what? A school can take advantage of it. A parent can take advantage of it. A homeschooler can take advantage of it. Right? Then it's because it's so open, it's such open source, then it becomes accessible to everybody. And schools can even enhance it and make it more advanced, add more things to it, and take it at a further level. But a parent says, I only have 20 minutes a day, what should I do with my child? They have something too. That's how we have to think about taking information and delivering it. Uh, to, to our children. And of course this, even in higher education, is beneficial. But we have to build it from the ground up. That's the other thing I personally feel, there are no standards right now. So we have the opportunity to rebuild the standards. What's the standard, you know, what is the standard Islamic knowledge for a 15-year-old Muslim boy or girl? We don't have it. What's a 10-year-old standard for Muslim boys and girls? What should they know by the age of 10? What should they know? There's no standard. Your child knows something else, my child knows something else, right? So if we develop powerful standards, then whoever believes in those standards will try to live up to them. And then over time, if those standards are powerful enough, we'll raise the level of awareness of the ummah altogether. We'll raise that level of awareness. And that's really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in rethinking how we distribute education in Islam. But I want to get to the point, because we're now in a global world, I want to get to the point where if I travel to Bangladesh, and I travel to Sri Lanka, and I travel to like Kuwait, and I meet a 10-year-old, they have the same education by the age of 10 that my child has in Texas, in Islam, in Arabic. They're on the same curriculum, even though their teachers are entirely different, right? Because they access the same standard, the same resources. That to me is, it has global ramifications. The way the ummah will look in 50 years will be completely different if we pull this off, if we can do this right. So in the beginning of my lecture, I told you I'm nearly done. I told you there's information, I told you there's understanding. What was the third component? Application. In the beginning of my lecture, I also told you that there was a unique situation in the ummah. The information, the understanding, and the application came from the shaykh. All of it came from the shaykh. Where do you go to learn? The shaykh. You learn the hadith from the shaykh. Then the shaykh explains it to you, so you get the understanding. Then you see the shaykh's behavior, you see him practically, and you get the application. All of it was coming from one person. So when the tabi'un were learning from Ibn Abbas anhuma, they were getting all three components of education at one time. Information, understanding, and application, mentorship, all of it was fused into one person. In the modern world, that is simply not possible. In the modern world, it's not possible for everyone. Some lucky of you, you might, you might find a shaykh, you sit at their feet, you know, and you learn from them, and you, know, you learn adab from them, and all of this other stuff. It's not possible for the entire ummah. It's just not. We're not. In the modern world, you are too busy 
You have, we're, schools are institutionalized. We don't even, you know, when our children go to school, which I told you already, most don't go to Islamic school. When our children go to public school, they have a great math teacher. But is that math teacher their character teacher too? No, they're not learning practical life from their math teacher. They're just learning what? Math. That's all they're learning. So we've broken education down into just give me the information. Give me the understanding. I don't want your practical lifestyle. I don't want that. We have alienated these things. Now we can't just complain about it. We have to accept that's reality and work with it. How do you then adjust your strategy based on this new reality that may not have been there before, right? Before the Imam of the Masjid was also the Murabbi of, the, of everybody's small community. Every two, three blocks there was a Masjid. Every Masjid had an elder and the elder was sort of a mentor to the children and things like that. That is a romantic model that is now gone. That is no longer the case. That is no longer the case. And you cannot expect the Imam or the teacher to give 10 people that kind of attention. What to speak of 100, what to speak of 1000. So how are we going to do this? The only solution that I, I've, I've been thinking about this for a long time. <laughs> what do we do about the practical side? And I've come to a, f a few conclusions. Number one conclusion I have come to is there is no school and there is no collective institution that can teach application. Schools, masjids, universities cannot teach Islamic what? Application. They cannot. They cannot teach adab. Schools cannot teach adab. They can, very limited. Very, very limited. Like respect for teacher they can teach. Fine. Respect for books they can teach. But the true application, like the practical dimension of Islam, can, that education can only come inside the house. Only. If you don't address it inside the house, you can kiss Islamic education goodbye. Because Islamic education will then only be information and understanding, but it will never be applied. Application is a, ma a project for the house itself. It is a project for the house itself. What do I mean? I mean I just taught my child to make dua to enter the house, but she never hears me make it. I never tell her, hey, we're going into the house. No, 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 you forgot, come back out, go again. Make the dua and go again. That is not just knowledge now, that is what? That's application. We just, uh, you know, after Maghrib, I just shared a hadith about jealousy. I shared a hadith about sharing, about giving. You just got into a fight with your sister. What do you remember from that hadith? Oh, the Prophet says, so and so and so and so and so. What are you going to do with your sister now? Sorry, you can have it. But I want to give it to you because the Prophet said so. Application. Application. Application will not come anywhere except family. And then the extension of that, this is very important for us, especially in an alienated society. You know, we, families that are worried about these things have to come together. Families that worry about the character of their children, right? They have to come together. But come together not to learn the, not to sit there in a lecture. No, 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 not for that. But to interact with each other. When you spend time with each other, that's when riba happens. That's when fights happen. That's when, you know, accidents happen. That's when somebody accidentally makes fun of someone and their feelings get hurt. When you have interaction. So the practical teaching of Islamic manners happens when people deal with each other. Right? You know what we need to do? You need to get all... You, some of your family lives in Ohio. Some of your family lives in Chicago. Some of your family lives in California. You need to have a family get together. Everybody. Everybody, once a summer. Everybody, let's do a road trip to Michigan. Let everybody, let's do a road trip to Ohio. Everybody, let's do a road trip somewhere. And the whole family gets together. Everybody gets together. All the people that usually say, you know, they like each other, but when they spend 10 days together, ho ho ho. And then families reminding each other. Families helping one another. Cousins are getting along. You know, we don't have that experience in the West, right? You just have husband, wife, children, and you visit the family once in a while. We don't have large family get-togethers. We don't have those, but we need to institutionalize those. And if you don't have large extended family, then do it with friends. Friends leaving home, going on a journey together, spending time with each other, building brotherhood, sisters building sisterhood, children building bond with each other, and you guys doing practical stuff like sharing. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a really big fan for practicality. I'm a really big fan of the Boy Scouts, for example. My boys get a little bit older. There's a, there's a Muslim Boy Scout thing in, uh, in Florida that I know about, Panama City. Fantastic stuff. 
Fantastic. The brother takes them from the masjid, they pray fajr, they go out in the woods, they have to, by the evening, the boys are told, well, we know how to build a fire here, we can show you how to do it, but you're going to build your own, you're going to cook your own. And you have to decide who's going to clean the plates, who's going to mind the tent, who's going to do this. You have to learn to work with each other. No cell phones, no video games, no nothing. No technology, no Wi-Fi, no 3G, no nothing. Just the woods and you, and you have to deal with human beings and learn to work together. It builds brotherhood, it builds character. It builds a sense of responsibility. Man, my job was to clean the plates. Now the plates aren't clean, now we can't have dinner. And it's too, too dark at night to go by the, the lake and wash the dishes. Can't do it now. Practical stuff. Practical stuff will come when we, do, when we start institutionalizing healthy family activities. That will be the way to internalize this stuff. The real teachers of adab are going to have to be the parents. And though you can relegate, you can outsource, you can outsource uh, math education, science education, English education, you can outsource those educations. But I'm arguing for the Muslim parents, you guys, we are going to have to become students just like we are teachers to our children for Arabic and for Islam. Because we don't know it ourselves, right? So we got to learn it and we got we to be co-students with our, our generation. So that by the time they're parents one day, they're only teachers. They're not students and teachers. They're just teachers. But if we're going to raise that bar in a generation, then we're going to have to humble ourselves and learn with our kids. Because right now you don't even know how to learn. You don't yourself know. This is the, the, the vision that I personally have for Islamic education at the elementary levels. In five minutes, as I wrap up, I'll share with you what my personal take is on Islamic education at the higher levels at the higher levels. Currently, we have Islamic institutions all over the Muslim world that offer uh, you know, uh, different kinds of certifications. So you have Darul Ulum, you know, Dewand. You have Jamiat Al-Azhar. You have Islamic University Medina. You have different institutions all over the world. Turkey has its institutions. Indonesia, Malaysia have their institutions. India, Pakistan have their institutions for Islamic studies, for Islamic studies. Though those institutions are great, there is a new need. In addition, not in replacement of those institutions, but in addition to those institutions, there is a very serious need. If somebody says, I want to study counseling, I want to study counseling, and I want to help Muslims, you know, marriage counseling, that sort of thing. Where do, you, where do I study Islamic counseling? I don't know where to point you. I don't know where to point you. I could say, go to a psychology program, go to a secular counseling program, and then maybe study with a shaykh or something like that. But we don't have a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD in Islamic counseling. We don't have a bachelor's, master's, PhD in Islamic political science. We don't have a bachelor's, master's, PhD in Islamic sociology. We don't have a bachelor's, master's, PhD in Islamic economics. We don't have these things. We don't have these things. Now does Islam have something to, to say about psychology, about counseling, about sociology, about economics, about politics? Does it have anything to say about these things? Absolutely, it does. But our education is based on the text itself. Sharia studies, aqidah studies, history studies. I'm arguing that those texts actually address a lot more than Sharia, aqidah and history. They actually address all, of you, all human concerns. They address all human concerns. And we have an opportunity in the United States because we're such a diverse population and we have scholars from so many different backgrounds that we can import here and they're already here even to start building specialized programs in Islamic studies. I don't want to build something that's already there. We shouldn't have to build our own Sharia program. Sharia programs are already there. We shouldn't have to build our own schools that teach Hanafi fiqh. Hanafi fiqh is already there. Shafi'i fiqh schools are already there. Maliki fiqh schools are already there. What isn't there? Schools that are, with the help of Islamic, traditional Islamic scholars, that are teaching the humanities, that are teaching the social sciences, that are allowing us to develop a generation of, you know, you know I have a degree in Islamic education. What that means is how do you teach children Islam? You, know, you, you get an education major, you, you should have an Islamic education major. I'm a certified Islamic teacher. We don't have that. We need it. It's a desperate need of, of, of our times. I want to get into marriage counseling from the Islamic perspective. I want to get into teen counseling from the Islamic perspective. I'd like to study you know, anthropology from the Islamic perspective. You know, I want to study medical ethics from the Islamic perspective. How many doctors in the, in the audience today? How many doctors? A number. Medical ethics issues come up or no? 
all the time. All the time. Where do you have to go? We don't even know where to go. Is there even at least some kind of training for Muslim doctors to have, okay, here's the medical ethics issues from the Islamic point of view. Here's what you, here's what you need to know, you're a guide, right? So I'm arguing that we in the United States are in a position to develop a practical higher Islamic education. Instead of a theoretical higher Islamic education, which is already in place. So you can have a PhD in tafsir, which is a PhD in the text. But PhD in tafsir as it relates to psychology is something else. As it relates to sociology is something else. You become a resource in a particular field. And I believe we have the opportunity to do that. And I believe if we have the vision to do that, it's just a matter of execution. Ameen, ameen, ameen. ameen ya Rab. And it, it, wallahi, if we can start doing this, you know the, the great advantage of it in my last minute, I said I'll end in five minutes, I will end in one minute now. What's the advantage of doing this? The advantage of doing this is the majority of the Muslim world today. Whose laptop? That's a really loud phone. It's a really loud, it's a very religious phone, but it's really loud. <laughs> so here's, here's what, and now I'll take a full minute again. I'll, re, I'll restart my clock because of the adhan on the phone. Um, you see, the vast majority of Muslims today, or such a huge number of Muslims today, that are educated. Maybe they're educated with a bachelor's, master's, maybe they're physicians, but they're middle class or upper middle class or upper class. You know what the assumption is in so many Muslim minds? That Islam is backwards. And it's not just Islam, they think religion itself is backwards. We're living in the modern time, in modern times. And as a result of modernity, we have to keep up with the times. And Islam is one of those things that is holding us back. Islam is not dealing with things that are happening right now. When we create practical Islamic education, that deals with realities of our time, then we are able to display in the most intellectual fashion that Islam in fact doesn't just deal with the situations of our time, the needs of our time, the criteria, the, you know, the areas of inquiry of our time, but actually has solutions in these areas that haven't yet even been discovered. It has things to offer the world of psychology that the world of psychology has never known. They have never known. I'm a, I'm a basic level student of psychology. I can tell you Islamic psychology can revolutionize how psychology is studied. It can completely revolutionize it. Modern psychology studies begins with the assumption that human beings are flawed. That they have to be fixed. They're just flawed. And from Freud onwards, we're, we're messed up and we have to get unmessed up. So whether it's by means of pills or therapy, whether it's cognitive or you know, medical, clinical psych, you have to undo the mess that you are. Islam begins with the premise that you are flawless. Kullu mawludin yuladu al fitra. You start with fitra. And then there were corruptions that came in. You have to, un if you can undo the corruptions, there's something good at the bottom. There's something pure. There's something great at the, at the essence of the human being. Is our approach going to be completely different as Muslim psychiatrists, psychologists? Yeah. It's going to be totally different. Islamic psychology says your whims, your desires, what you wish for, what you want. Allah put that in you, but you have to control it to, in order to achieve happiness. If you let your desires control you, you will be miserable in this dunya and in the akhirah. Modern psychology says, do what, you, what feels good. Do what feels good. That's what they'll tell you. What makes you feel comfortable? That must be the judge of what is right for you. Because what is right for you is not what's right for me. Everybody has their own what's right for you based on what? Your whim, your personal desire. Does Islam have something else to offer? Even on the psychological side, absolutely. And I'm not even, I'm not a PhD in psychology, I'm just basic level, bachelor's level psychology. But I'm telling you, we have a completely different worldview to offer. And it can really help people. <laughs> this deen came to help humanity, right? So we are going to be able to give the highest levels of education in Islam if we address the foundations. This is the few things that I wanted to share with you about the renaissance in Islam that inshallah ta'ala, I'm completely optimistic that it's coming. If, if we have the vision for it and we have the drive for it, bi-idhnillah ta'ala, we will achieve it. In our own lifetime, we will see a revolution in how Islam is understood all across the world and the ummah will be uplifted in its information, in its understanding, and in its application. Barakallahu li walakum. I'll open it up at this point, inshallah ta'ala, for questions and answers. But before that, uh, Suhail and, and some of the associates at, uh, at Sufa are going to make some announcements for you guys. Jazakumullah.